Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. Welcome to another edition of Gear Wednesday, and I'm with Bill Vanderheiden, and he's the owner of Iron Will Broadheads, reliable as science allows. What does that mean, Bill? <laughs> well, Bruce, thanks for having me on. You're welcome. I guess what it means is there's been a lot of engineering put into this. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer, been working on product development 25 years, and when I set out to to make a better broadhead, I really went through all the steps that I would in my normal engineering job of, you know, really um, analyzing, you know, using all the engineering tools and computer simulations um, to get, you know, the best geometry for strength and flight. Also the best materials that I could find out there to meet the specific requirements of a broadhead, which is, it's a difficult task for something to do is fly at that high speed impact, impact something, which might be a hard bone. And then, not bend, not be damaged, not have a brittle failure either and stay sharp and go through. Um, so, you know, really a lot of engineering went into picking the best materials and manufacturing processes to make it as reliable as science allows. Do you have any um, broadheads with you? Do you have any on your desk? I do. Let's see. Is this going to be a video or a... Yeah, well, I, I'm doing it. It'll go up on YouTube. Okay. Yeah, so if you, got, if you got a broadhead. You're showing the box too. Yeah, so here's a six pack. I work with uh, SKB to make a custom broadhead case for us. So we now sell a six pack of broadheads in this in this case. So Two why don't you take one out case. and uh, we can talk about it because I want to talk about what it's made of, grade of steel or titanium, whatever it's made of, because people look at spending what's your suggested retail price, thirty bucks a piece. Yeah, it ends up being about $33 a piece or $99.95 for a three-pack. Okay. And so they're two to three times higher than most broadheads out there right now. And you know, a lot of that is just the materials manufacturing processes that went into it. So we use a premium blade steel. We do a heat treat process to get them very hard. We have 60 Rockwell C hardness, so we can get a very sharp edge and have good edge retention with that. Also, we're using the A2 tool steel because it has not only the hardness property that we can get with it, but also the excellent impact toughness. That material is used in uh, metal stamping dies, you know, to cut other metals. So it can be made both hard and have high impact toughness. So we go through this triple temper process to the heat treat to bring out that higher toughness. We also do this, you know, sub-zero quench where we're, it's really trying to improve the microstructure and get the highest performance we can out of the steel. So a lot goes into the manufacturing process. And then the ferrules, we use a grade five titanium ferrule in our lighter weight heads, because that really has the best strength to weight ratio of anything. So we can get a lot of material in that ferrule to have good support to the blade, but yet still have high strength and have high impact strength there. So, you know, titanium material costs more, but also um, we machine it in that hardened state. So you have to machine it very slowly. And so overall, a ferrule made out of titanium is going to cost five, six times as much as one that's out of, out of aluminum or a softer steel. But really, you get higher performance with that. So we do charge a higher price, but it's really because um, you get higher performance. You, know, you get what you pay for. Now, I know Aaron Schneider likes your broadhead. Why is he bullish on I Am Will? You know, Aaron is, he hunts a lot, gets a lot of animals every year. I don't know what he gets, maybe 30 animals a year or something like that. And he has for many, many years. So, and he likes to test a lot of different gear and just use the top performing gear around. And um, he's tested our broadheads compared to several other ones out there. And, and he feels like it's one of the best ones uh, as far as a fixed broadhead that he can shoot really well at long range. He's been using a trad bow lately, but when he was using this compound, you know, he told me they group well for him at 100 yards, even 120 yards. He could group with field points. And also, 
you know, that edge retention, you can shoot through an animal. He shot through his bear last year. It was standing up and it had its arm in front of the body and he, he broke through the leg bone, just broke it clean in half, went through into the vitals and, um, and the head was still good, you know, after that. So, so I think it's that top performance to the broadhead and a majority of them are elk hunters, guys going after this bigger, bigger game, you know, heading out West where you might have longer shots as well. So we did a lot of work to make them fly well at, at long range. And you know, a lot of, a lot of guys are using them for that reason as well. You know, for the whitetail hunter, when your shots are closer up, you know, 30 yards and in probably, and the, and the whitetail body isn't nearly as big as an elk either. You know, I think you might think it's overkill for a whitetail and it probably is, but um, the advantage I think you get is that you can use it on multiple whitetails. I've got a friend that's taken six whitetails with the same broadhead and um, it's a lifetime guarantee also. If you do damage it, we replace it. But typically I find you blow through them, stick in the dirt, pull it back out, it still shaves hair, clean it off, put it back in your quiver and keep using it. You know, spin the arrow, make sure it spins true. Check to see that you still can shave hair on your arm. And typically you can. And that's the difference with a premium blade steel at 60 Rockwell C hardness is that it retains the edge a really long time. So it's not unusual at all for me to blow through an elk and still shave hair with it. I took two elk with the same broadhead a few years ago because, yeah, it looked like brand new. This is after a 54-yard pass-through shot on the first elk. I could still shave hair and put it in my quiver and end up shooting a big bull with that same head um, about a week later. Whitetail Rendezvous and Stripe Force Energy have joined together. What are they joined together to do? Well, they joined together to help you kick the can. That's right. Strike Force Energy is the fastest growing new energy drink on Amazon today. It's simple. All you do is rip, drip, and sip. That's it. No sugar, no crash, no calories. It gives you the ability to focus and stay in the stand, stay on the hunt all day long without carrying around a can. When I get a sample pack, simply go to strikeforceenergy.com put in wr free and you'll get a four count sample pack from strike force energy now what about for crossbows any different to put it on a crossbow i don't have a lot of experience with crossbows myself i did buy one about two years ago and, and i use it for testing i can shoot really tight groups with the crossbow myself with the hunter grain we mostly tested our v100 and our v125 um, they shoot really well for me there. We do have a lot of crossbow hunters now that are using them. There's a review on YouTube now. I think if you look up Raven 10 crossbow broadhead testing, a guy there did, I think his name was Ben Eddy, tested four or five different broadheads with his Raven crossbow through a bunch of, I think he went through um, deer shoulder blades and different materials and, um, and also just looked at how well they grouped. And uh, Iron Will performed the top out of the broadheads he looked at there. So We've had good feedback on crossbow from people as well. I'm hearing a lot of FOC forward of center. Talk to me about that factor in speed, accuracy, and uh, penetration. Yeah, so my opinion on it is that you don't need extreme FOC. And what I see happening right now, it's a bit concerning, is that I know a number of guys that do custom aero builds for people as a business. And more and more guys are coming to them asking for extreme FOC. They want that 25%, 30% FOC. And often it's difficult to do that without becoming underspined. And so a lot of these guys I know, or a couple of these guys I know, they're going back to their, you know, client and saying, Hey, this is, I can get you this FOC, but you're a little underspined. And they're like, Oh, that's perfect. That's what I want. So that's my concern is that really arrow flight needs to be number one. You don't want to be underspined on a compound shooting fixed blade heads. So I caution people that try to get too high. Personally, I think that 12 to 16% is good. We've seen great results with that amount of FOC. We do sell broadheads from 100 grain at 100, 125, 150, 175, 200, 225, and 250 grains. And they're all basically using the same blades. The weight is added in the ferrule. So you can go as heavy as you want, with our broadheads to get that higher FOC, I just caution to make sure, make sure you're not underspined. Look at the charts or use one of these online programs and higher FOC is better in general. I do agree that it'll give you a little more stability in flight. It can give you a little more, well, 
often if you go higher FOC, you're getting a higher arrow weight as well. And it's really that higher arrow mass that's giving you more retained momentum, better penetration. So I'm a fan of a little heavier arrow, um, a little bit more FOC is fine. Just don't try to push it to an extreme where you're underspined or that your arrow is just dropping like a rock. And it doesn't matter so much if you're at 20, 30 yards, white tail stand, tree stand kind of hunting, you know, then the high FOC, there isn't really much negative as long as you're not underspined. At some point, it can get to where it's less forgiving when it's too heavy up front because when you've got all that mass up front and you're launching it from your bow, your, your arrow, now you're trying to push that heavy weight through this, you know, typically it's a pretty thin arrow if there's that much FOC. So you're pushing it through there and that whole bending and flexing becomes greater and more critical now, I think. So any little errors in flaw can actually become worse, I think, if you're at the extreme level. So Anyway, that's maybe more than you wanted to know, but I think... Um, no, you know, that's my- perfect because I want people to know, you know, I've had enough people in conversations, you know, they're saying, well, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and I'm going, okay, and uh, I'm not an expert, but you are, and so that's why I want to share it with people to have some common sense, if you will, and some reality sets, got to set in someplace because it's like shooting bullet at over 4,000 feet per second. I used to shoot prairie dog. And my bullets would come apart. They would just melt. All the lead would come right off. You know, there was nothing else downrange. And they would actually smudge when the temperatures outside got hot and the bullet left the gun at over 4,000 feet per second. You'd see a smudge and the the bullet was gone. Yeah, you know, I I look at a lot of the physics behind things and, and try and study the engineering and try not to just believe people that you hear out there saying certain things, but rather... Just see, does the science support it? And there's this push out there that high FOC will give you 30% or 60% greater penetration. And that's bunk, man. That is not right in terms of science. It doesn't support it. This is like if you're taking two arrows that have the same momentum, the higher FOC isn't going to give you probably any more penetration um, or very little. And if you look at penetration, it's really the momentum of the arrow as it impacts that will determine the penetration. And so change in momentum, so momentum is mass times velocity. A heavier arrow, you'll have more momentum when you get down range typically because you know a heavier arrow out of your bow is just more efficient, so you get a little bit more momentum as it leaves the bow. And then at the lower velocity, you have actually have less drag as well. So you get more retained momentum, which is that product of mass times velocity down range. So, I agree that a heavier arrow will give you more penetration downrange, but now FOC is really just, okay, where's the center of mass of that arrow, you know, relative to the center of the arrow. And if from going, say a couple inches forward to three inches forward, you shift your FOC by a lot. I don't think it has very much effect at all on how much actual penetration you get. If you think about where the center mass is, really it's just mass times velocity is going to be equal to force times time, that product, which is going to be, and you know, it varies as you go through the animal, but it's basically kind of that area under that curve of force over time. So you change momentum, momentum, mass times velocity, it'll end up being zero. So you take that product, it's going to be equal to force times time. So FOC doesn't enter into that equation. That's maybe the slight second order effect of, okay, if your mass is a little further back, maybe you're getting more flexing of the arrow and you're going to kind of lose some efficiency there, but that's a very small effect, I think. So anyway, I think this high FOC push out there that you're going to get way higher penetration is, um, it's mistaken. I believe, you know, the science doesn't really support it and guys are focusing more on that than good arrow flight. And so I think number one is that your arrow is going straight when it hits the animal and good arrow flight and hitting where you want to, I mean, hitting in the vitals. So I definitely push those over the extreme high FOC that, that a lot of people are going to out there. And thanks for that. And let's get back to the broadhead itself. And you have beveled edges. What's the advantage there? Yeah. So I think, you know, your audience is mostly whitetail hunters, right? So let's talk in terms of whitetails. I think the advantage you'd have with our broadhead is that it opens up some shot opportunities, I believe. You know, I think the best place to shoot a whitetail personally is right in that golden triangle, you know, right kind of in front of the crease there, or as close as you can, you know, very close to really the shoulder blades, shoulder bones, that top of the heart, lung area. 
and it's really close to uh, shoulder bone, leg bones there. But I like to shoot there. I think you get the quickest kill, and and typically white tails are dropping in sight for me if you can hit there. You know, extremely sharp broadhead that stays sharp. You know, what I found with other broadheads, a lot of them out there aren't very sharp out of the box. So do this test on your broadheads. Take them out of the box. If you can't shave a hair with them, take them back. You know, get some different ones. Demand that broadhead manufacturers make them sharp. Um, I think there's such a push to make them lower cost and make money by these companies that they might skip some steps like those final grinding and honing steps. So one, make sure they shave hair out of the package. You'd be surprised how many don't. Um, the other thing I find is that with these steels that have a lower hardness and especially mechanicals um, where they don't want the blades to break. So they're, they want them to bend and be, not be brittle at all. So their Rockwell C hardness is down around 45, 48. Well, that's very poor for edge retention. So typically, I push that through a deer hide and just that hair and hide will take that edge away. So you're really not slicing tissue very well after that. You're kind of tearing it and you're not getting the, the bleeding that you could. You know, with our broadhead, it'll stay, you know, razor sharp and slice all the way through, get you that exit hole, get you a quick kill. Um, so that's, I think, an advantage of our, of our steel and our edges. The other thing is if you hit the shoulder blade, you're going to go right through. I've had probably 30 people in this past year tell me they've gotten complete pass-through shots on elk, including going through one or both shoulder blades on elk. So a white tail. That's impressive, folks. If you've ever taken on that part, it's not a deer or it's not an antelope. It's sizable. And I've yeah. seen one broadhead go halfway through the elk and we got the elk. They had to shoot it. We had to shoot it again wasn't my shot. It was a different guy. But when we did the horse modem, because we wanted to see, we had the arrow manufacturer with us and he wanted to take pictures and see what happened. And then went halfway through. So at 350 feet a second, you know, pick a number and you're shooting a 125 or whatever blade, iron welds are going are gonna to penetrate and grow through the shoulder blade. And so you're going to harvest that out. Yeah, and that's really what got me started is I, I hit an elk in a shoulder blade many years ago with a broadhead and it, it failed. You know, it, it didn't penetrate, but a couple inches. And, you know, I just think the vitals are so close to that shoulder, the shoulder bone area that you just need a broadhead that's going to get through there. So that's a lot of, um, you know, that was really my initial goal is just get that penetration through bone without damaging the head, stay sharp, slice through those vitals and get that kill rather than, you know, heartbreaking loss of an elk after you put in so much work to get that shot. That's the thing. And that's just like bullets. Um, when I used to rifle hunt quite a bit, I, which I don't do so much anymore, but you know, I put the best bullet in the cartridge that I can. I use nozzle partition bullets and now there's burger bullets. There's plenty, there's fantastic bullets out there, but if you get down to it, the people who harvest numerous heads of game every year, they use the best possible bullet. All their components are the best possible. And that's just the way hunting is because you owe the animal the most ethical, humane, fast kill that you can do. And you need a bullet that's going to stay together. And then it comes to the same thing with broadhead. You have to just bounce off ribs penetrate ribs, snap ribs, go through leg bones. I remember seeing that picture of the bear. I think you had a moose picture also that it was complete penetration with the broadhead. One, these are good archers. They're after big game, so they know what they're up against, and so they load up. And thinking about $100 for free blades, well, if that one blade lasts you three years, that's 10 bucks a year. You know, just play with the math with me a little bit. So right. now, you know, three blades, you know, you've got really, let's say you kill one or two bucks and three does. You kill five deer. Based on what I know about iron wheel broadheads is that a slight tune up, as long as I didn't go through a shoulder blade or something like that, I could kill five deer with one uh, broadhead. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, for sure. And even through the shoulder blade, I think, you know, my last couple of mule deer I, I took were actually quartering on shots. I just... You know, I kind of know where the bone structure is and I aim to not hit the shoulder. And it just depends on how much they're angled to me, whether or not I shoot left of that bone and try and go through there or, you know, right of the bone kind of in that triangle. But in one of those, um, I hit the bone, and but it went right through. And I couldn't tell the broadhead spun through and it still looked good. 
I touched the edge up a little bit and it was good to go. So, yeah, I think you could definitely use them for multiple animals. And it's really, I mean, if you hit a rock, a boulder, that's when you're going to do a little damage. But typically they still spin true. You can even touch them up then. It just takes a little more work. I think I'd send it back to you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we have a lifetime guarantee. So if you break one, yeah, (laughs) you break a band one, we replace it. Whitetail Rendezvous is pleased to announce a partnership with GoHunt.com. Who's GoHunt.com? Well, if you're a DIY hunter, you need the information at GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Why? Because it provides 4,200 profiles, every unit, every species, and every season. Furthermore, they give in-depth analysis, interactive maps, unit access, and seasonal trends. Draw odds are very important, and they give you the most accurate information in the business. All this is available when you go to gohunt.com forward slash insider. Make sure you use promo code WR when you join Insider. You'll get a $50 gift card for gohunt.com gear shop. All in all, if you're hunting out west in 2018, gohunt.com insider is where you need to be to get all the research information. When you use promo code WR, Whitetail Rendezvous receives a small commission from GoHunt.com. Oh, interesting thing what you said. So all the weight forward, the 250 gram, all that's in the titanium ferrule. Is that correct? So in the heavier weights, we use the hardened steel ferrule just to get that added weight. So that's yeah. why you know, we can use the same blades and the brides don't look much different in the heavier weights, but going to that steel ferrule, we've just added a lot of the mass right there in the ferrule. So the cutting diameter isn't any different? It's not. No, it's the same blade sets are used. Yes. Okay. So you got to think of that, folks. If you do, you know, go after a grizzly bear or go to Africa and start shooting plains games or even dangerous games, which people have taken Cape Buffalo with Iron Will Broadhead. One thing I've noticed there seems to be some other people picking up the competition of world-class, expensive, two-blade broadheads. Is that because of your success, or is that because of market demand? I don't know if we've had that much influence. You know, this is only really our third year where people have known about us, um, but I think we're definitely growing a lot. We're getting a strong customer following. I think once people get our broadheads in their hands and actually see them, they realize man, this does look like a high quality head. It's really a cut above what I'm used to. And then, but when they put it through an animal and afterwards they see that it still looks new and can shave hair and still spin true. Now they're seeing, wow, this is a step change improvement from what I thought broadheads could do. And so we're definitely getting a strong following, you know, for those reasons. Um, I was always a three blade guy before, you know, I grew up whitetail hunting in Wisconsin and I always felt like three blade might fly better and plane less and things like that. And, and really they, they don't, um, a two blade, you have to be careful with the size and ours are fairly compact. You know, our overall length is just 1.2 inches. It has that second angle or that tanto tip that's, you know, brings the length back in and adds strength to the tip. Um, and you know, a lot of work went into having good aerodynamic flight here. So I'm not, I can't say that all two blades are going to, Fly well, you know, the old big Zwickies. I've heard a lot of nightmares though on people trying to get those to fly well at long range. But the reason for the two blade is it way out penetrates a three blade. You know, I've done this force testing where I measure the force, push it down through hides, say um, deer hides or, or moose hides, through the hair, through the hide, through some foam. And I've done it with a bunch of different broadhead designs. Yeah, we are. We take about half as much force to penetrate as the other typical two blades out there. And I believe that's because of our extremely sharp edges and good edge retention. So like I was saying before, change of momentum is going to equal force times time. So if you can reduce that force, say cut that force in half, it's going to be pushing through for twice as long. So you can essentially double your penetration by reducing your force to half to penetrate. Um, So that was other two blades. Now, when I tested recently on moose hide against mechanicals and then also some three blade, like chisel point type heads for those to penetrate. Now this is just through a thick moose hide and hair. It was taken over 10 times the force for the three blade heads with a chisel point to penetrate that moose hide. So there's a big difference there in, in the force to penetrate when you have an extremely sharp, you know, cut on contact two blade, you can really get, much lower force, which means much further penetration. I mean, 
more than double type penetration um, on animal. And on a white tail, maybe it doesn't matter so much, but on a big animal like an elk, if it's quartering away and you've got, you know, I put one through an elk where it entered near the hip and it passed through the heart and came up, up by the brisket. So that was four, four and a half feet of elk. Um, and you often you're going through the stomach that might be full of matted grass and stuff like that. So penetration matters when you want those shot options like steep quartering away, for instance, or shots where you might be hitting, hitting some bone and you just need that further penetration uh, through bone as well. Yeah. I'm just loving sitting talking to you because, you know, it's so important. Uh, I'll just go back to the selection of broadhead and there's so much marketing out there and great marketing programs, but I've never been a mechanical person, you know, and I shoot three blades that are fixed. That's what I presently shoot. I just want to urge everybody to take a look at what they're shooting. And if you're getting good result, great on whitetails. If you're ever thinking about coming out West, I think you really need to, you know, take a hard look at penetration and um, the power of three blade at minimum, and then step up to the two blade like, um, like Bill has created because elk are tough. I've seen people hit them with 300 wind mags and they just walk away and they go, what? <laughs> they are you know, tough. And they uh, take a lot of killing. Yeah, they're a tough animal. And if you get, if you only get through one lung and not two, that's why penetration is so important. I think if you're just penetrating enough to get through that first lung, but not the second, man, they can go a long way. You're probably not going to recover them. You're not going to get them. That day. You're probably- In my experience, he's going to get, five miles away or more and get someplace that you're not going to find them. Plus you're not going to bleed. You know, if it doesn't punch all the way through, if you don't get a pass through, then your blood trails less. I mean, everything's just less. Right. So I think a lot of people have it in their head. Well, I don't care about the exit hole. A big entrance hole is, is all I need. I think that's bad on any animal, even whitetails personally, but especially on a big animal like an elk, you want to get that penetration to make sure you get both lungs, you know, get through, as many vital organs as you can and, uh, and get that exit hole too. You know, we've been talking a half an hour here or so. What's your recommendation for people that are interested in your broadhead? Where can they go and, and see some YouTube videos and, you know, get a hold of you if they want to? How can they reach out to you? Yes. Yeah, so you can follow us on Instagram. That's at Ironwell Outfitters and YouTube is also Ironwell Outfitters and Facebook. We have Iron Wall Outfitters. Our website is um, ironwalloutfitters.com. You can check out our products there. We have some new products now. I've just made a solid blade 100 grain that I think will be pretty popular with the whitetail guys, as well as we're coming out with some ultralight knives now. I've been working on a, a knife for a while. You know, I do a lot of backpack hunting where I'm packing in five to 10 miles back. And so extra weight is, um, is something I don't really want to carry. And I also don't really like those replacement blade knives. I just think they break too easy. I don't want to really replace them in the middle of, a, of an elk. So I haven't been really happy with the premium knife steel ultralight heads. I think there's pretty kind of limited selection there. So um, just started making an ultralight knife. It weighs one ounce. I was able to get through a complete elk skin, deboned, quartered the elk and my mule deer with one, with one knife without touching it up. And at only an ounce, that's, um, that's a lot better than what I was doing. I had, before I had two knives that were, you know, I had a knife plus a backup and it was nearly a pound of weight. So um, what about anyways, the handle? I'm thinking, you know, it's great. You get an ounce blade, but what type of handle? Because elk big and messy and sloppy and snow and rain. And, you know, I wear cotton gloves when I'm cutting an elk up, I guess they're roper gloves. I don't know, but you know, I wear gloves. So I want something to hold on to. Talk to me about that. So it just has kind of a skeleton blade and you can right. unwrap it. We'll include paracord so you can do a paracord type wrap on it. But I've done that just to keep it ultra light. I like that. So you just wrapped yeah. it yourself? Yes. You know, we'll probably send instructions on different ways you can wrap them or you can check that on YouTube. There's a lot of different ways to wrap a skeleton type knife out there. But so what I've got is, uh, you know, on the bottom, you have this kind of dip here for this finger. And then on top, we've got these. Yeah, ridges that go out. And so, you know, you got a pretty good hold on it with that. And we've got cutting edges on top here. So this is something that's different. It's patent pending, but it's two sharp edges here on top. And 
what I do is I use those top edges to do all the rips through the hide. So it's that cutting through hide and hair that really dull a knife quickly. So if you can use those top edges to do all the hide cuts, then the belly of the knife just to, to skin and debone, that stays sharp a really long time that way. So it's kind of like having two knives in one with having sharp top edges as well. And, and like I said, it just weighs one ounce. So it's... Um, yeah, and the paracord, three ounces maybe it adds to it? The, with the paracord added? No, yeah. it's, uh, it's still going to be under two ounces with the sheath. I think with the sheath, it's going to be around 1.3. It might only be maybe one and a half or... It's still under two ounces, I'd say, with the sheet added. Yeah, because I like that better. I don't know if you had it at ATA, but I've seen, you know, skeleton knives, if you want to call them that. I'm going, they look like throwing knives for ninjas rather than in the field, you know, with my with my gloves on and mm. taking animals apart. Yeah, I've done it both with, I thought I really want the paracord as well, just because it bulks it up and adds, it's pretty good grip, actually, pretty good feel with paracord wrapped on there. I was surprised how well it seems to work, but I placed them with about a dozen, you know, pretty serious backcountry hunters this past year and got feedback. And um, there's a mix. Some guys are saying, I've got to have a paracord wrap, but there's a bunch of guys that say, I, no, I don't, I don't want anything on there. One guy's used it on a bunch of animals this year that doesn't really like it. And, and really it's, it works pretty good without it too. I mean, it doesn't, the grip is pretty good. And um, so I think it works better than people might think without anything on it too, but you can go either way. Hey, folks, Bruce Hutchin, host of Whitetail Rendezvous. Hey, I'm pleased to announce that Buckwell Coffee is continuing their sponsorship for 2019. What's so special about Buckwell Coffee? Well, a gazillion people every day go to Starbucks and buy coffee. Well, I'll ship it to your house. Yes, I'll ship light, medium, or dark roast, ground, or bean right to your house. It's real simple. Just go to whitetailrendezvous.com forward slash shop, pick out what roast you want, and we'll ship it out. Take a look at Buck Wild Coffee, the finest roasts in the West. Well, the finest roasts around the campfire, the finest roasts around your kitchen table. It's just flat out the finest roasts you can get today. Order some at whitetailrendezvous.com forward slash shop. Bill, this has been just great to sit and to visit again. And I'm always looking forward to hearing innovation and you're an innovator. And, you know, you put a product out there and you priced it, what it's worth. You could just run the numbers as I did earlier, folks, and you buy three blades and you take up to uh, five deer with them. Uh, you can get three seasons, let's say, and probably more if you can touch them up. Now, let's talk about, before we close, about touching them up. You know, are you using a stone, ceramic sticks, or what are you using to touch them up? Yeah, you can touch them up really about any way you would touch up a knife, you know, a, a premium blade steel knife. So we sell two different sharpeners. Now we have a double-sided ceramic stone. It's really a medium high alumina ceramic stone on one side and then an extra fine on the other side. So the medium is used if you say hit a rock and you got a little ding in the edge, you can use the medium side to basically kind of regrind that edge back on there. And I have videos on our YouTube channel showing how to do that. I've done a lot so I can kind of freehand and I kind of show how to set the angle on there and just freehand it, the medium size to take out nicks and then the fine side. If all you've done is shoot through an animal or shoot into foam, just use the fine side and within a minute you should be shaving hair again with that side. But we've had, well, Aaron Snyder was the one guy that pushed me on making a little carbide sharpener that where the angles are preset to match our broadhead. So I just came out with that as well. It's a little handheld sharpener with these two carbide blades where you just, um, it'll work for both our knives and our broadheads where you just put it in that carbide and just draw it back towards you. With those carbide sharpeners, carbide's extremely hard. And if you put too much pressure, you can actually damage an edge or bend over or create a burr. So the only thing there to do is just light pressure and a bunch of strokes. You know, 20 light strokes is way better than like two or three hard strokes. But I found that works well also to just maintain the edges. It doesn't take very much at all to get shaving hair again with that sharpener too. But you can also use a lot of different knife sharpeners, say like a, a Gatco, a Lansky, or KME type knife sharpeners where you clamp the blade and um, they held it at set angles 
to these flat stones, you know, those work really well too. If, if you've got one of those and are comfortable using it, you know, go ahead and use that. So folks, this ends another gear Wednesday with Bill Werner Hyden of Iron Will Outfitters, makers of Iron Will Broadheads. Bill, it's just been a pleasure, man. Yeah, great talking to you, Bruce. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.